I'm Lisa de Nicolitz and I'd like to read to you from my latest novel, A Glittering Chaos, and as they say, viewer discretion advised. The passage I'm going to read to you is about Hans. Hans is the husband to Melazine, and Hans is not doing too well right now. Hans walks slowly out of the office and gets into his car. He drives to the poorest part of town, a seedy area filled with run-down motels that offer room by the, rooms by the hour. He parks his car and looks around. He's never picked up a prostitute before and has no idea how to go about it, but he doesn't have to wait or wonder for long. A woman in her early thirties comes up to him. She's wearing battered brown cowboy boots, an ill-fitting denim miniskirt and an unbuttoned purple satin blouse that reveals a lacy orange bra. You're looking for company, she says. Yes, but you're too old, Hans is brusque. I want someone about 14. The woman gives a phlegmy laugh. You're going to get yourself into trouble, honey, talking like that. I think what you meant to say was you'd like a girl who looks about 14. Don't want to get caught for rape now, do you? He nods. So do you know anyone who looks about 14? Yes. Go into that hotel on the corner. Tell them Rosalind is fixing you up and ask for room 215. Got it? Hans heads over to the hotel and does what she says. He takes the stairs to the second floor, not trusting the elevator. The place smells of tired, unwashed folk who've been down on their luck for a while. It's as if he's fallen into a bin of unsorted clothes at the Salvation Army. He opens the door to the room and sits down on the edge of the bed. The room is as stale and musty as the hallway and there's the added hint of bug spray and cheap furniture polish, although he's at a loss to see what would warrant polishing. He thinks he should feel nervous, but he really doesn't feel anything at all. There's a knock on the door and a girl comes in and Hans is instantly disappointed. Apart from being the right age, she couldn't be more different to Kateri. She's got short black hair with crimson streaks and dozens of piercing, and she reminds him of Nika. No, he says, you're all wrong, I'm sorry, but I need a pale blonde girl your age with no piercings, no thick makeup and no tattoos, and I want a clean girl. The girl shrugs and vanishes. Hans looks at his watch. He's not sure what to do. Should he go downstairs and find Rosalind, or will the gothic girl give her the message? He decides to wait for a bit. Fifteen minutes later, a new girl sticks her head around the door. She's younger, platinum blonde and skinny, and from the looks of it, she's just given her face a scrubbing, and she's not wearing any jewellery. Good. Hans nods and waves in. Much better. Come in. Would you mind washing your feet for me? The girl goes into the bathroom without comment, and washes her feet in the basin. And then she comes back and starts to undress. No, no. Keep your clothes on. Now sit on the bed, like so, a little propped up. He gets her organized, and then he sits on the bed, cross-legged, and he takes her feet in his hands. She doesn't say anything. And Hans tries very hard. He closes his eyes and tries to pretend that the girl is Kateri, but he can't. The room's putrid funk is too strong, and more importantly, the girl's feet feel all wrong. They're calloused, cracked, and hard particularly around her heels, and she's got strange toes, with the second toe much longer than her big toe, and all her toes splay out slightly. For such a pretty girl, you've got very ugly feet, Hans says accusingly after a while, when he realizes this exercise is in vain. We'll have to try something else. Lie down, I'll show you how. He positions her, and then he lies down next to her, with his forehead almost touching hers. He closes his eyes. But the girl smells wrong, 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 and Hans is angry. Despite her efforts to clean herself off, he can smell the remnants of her cheap makeup, and he feels nauseous. This was such a good idea. It really should have worked, he sighs. He experimentally put one hand on the girl's throat and the other on her mouth, and his penis quivers slightly, but again, nothing works, and Hans wants to weep. Look, he says, sitting up. You're wrong, and I can't fix it. He pays her. Go, just leave me alone. She takes the money, slips on her shoes, and leaves. She hasn't said one word throughout this whole encounter. Hans looks around the dingy room. He knows he was rude to the girl, but he doesn't care. It was her fault. He thinks about her nasty feet, and he shudders. 
He gets up to wash his hands and he runs the water to scalding, rubbing his hands for a long time. Unsure what to do next, he looks at his watch. He doesn't want to go home yet, but he doesn't want to stay in the room. He goes downstairs and out into the wintry sunshine. And he sees a park bench across the street and he goes over and sits down. The sunshine feels good on his skin and in that moment he is happy, happy and free. Free from his work and his wife and his worries. And the only way that his life could be any better at that moment would be if he had a glass of red wine. He looks up and sees a liquor store in the direct line of his vision. Thinking that he might as well get stocked up for the evening, he goes in and buys four bottles of the cheapest red wine he can find. He has long since decided that he'd rather have more of a cheaper brand than less of his favorite. And then, without having made any conscious decision to do such a thing, he goes to a nearby convenience store and buys a bottle of cranberry juice. He empties the juice into a concrete planter full of dead leaves and pigeon crud, and then he quickly decants half a bottle of wine into the juice bottle. He returns to the bench and sits in the fading sunshine, drinking contentedly. The mid-February temperatures are only slightly above freezing, but he doesn't feel the cold. He wonders what to do about Judita. It's clear she won't carry on unless he can pay her, and the only asset he's got left is his car. He thinks about borrowing from Jonas, borrowing from the college fund he set up for him, but he can't figure out a way to do it without Melazine finding out. Come evening he's drunk and he staggers over to his car. He drives home with extra care and immediately makes for his easy chair. Melazine arrives shortly after him and soon after that his son drops by for a visit. He ignores them both and lies on his chair, wondering if he'll be drunk enough by bedtime to be able to have just one good night's sleep. He thinks that perhaps he should sleep in his chair and avoid the bedroom entirely. Yes, that might help. So there we have Hans, as I say, not doing too well, um, from A Glittering Chaos, which you can purchase on Amazon.ca, or if you're in Canada, you can purchase it from a bookstore. And I hope you enjoyed the reading. Thank you.